I always almost hope don't that people don't see what's going on behind me because my house yeah. is always like mass chaos. So it looks very calm now that oh, you say that. Yes. Well, if you hear a lot of background noise, let me know and I'll go yell at them. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right, well, let's get started, guys. We gave it a solid extra five minutes. Um, <clears throat> so for all of our attendees and Madam Stewart as well, I'm Justine. Um, I am the arts chair of HYP this year, and I had the pleasure of being the arts chair last year as well. Um, I'm so grateful that we're getting to talk with Stuart and Matt tonight and pick their brains a little bit about this wonderful, really gem of, a, of an orchestra we have in our in our city, which has been around for 90 years now. Um, and so it's important, you know, as a part of HYP, we want to make sure we're spreading some of the great news about what this city has to offer and really opening people's eyes to, to a lot of the great arts offerings. Um, so thank you guys for joining us. Thank you. Pleasure. Stuart is our maestro. Mm -hmm. um, he is the conductor of the Harrisburg Symphony Orchestra and Matt is the executive director. So we're gonna go through here and you know, ask both of them some questions um, and learn a little bit more about their positions, uh, their careers and the orchestra as a whole. So I will pull up the PowerPoint for you here um, so that we can get some background and get things started. And this is just a quick overview of who we are. Yes, all right, bear with me here. I'm gonna have to. Oh. <clears throat> Great. Okay, did it make, did it go full screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. You Thank let me you. know when, oh, oh my goodness. What'd I just do? Okay, we're back. <laughs> okay. Everything look good? Everything's great. Looks great. Yeah. So this is us, the Harrisburg Symphony Orchestra, 91 years old, <clears throat> founded 1931. Our first public concert was March 19, 1931 at um, William Penn High School. And as a nonprofit, we of course are driven by our mission, which is to present inspiring music for the community and enrich the cultural life of, I can't quote it yet. So I'm really, sorry, it's okay. I think I went ahead too quickly. I've been here 20 years and I still there can't quote it. Um, <laughs> performances, symphonic performances and educational programs for audiences of all ages to foster an appreciation for and knowledge of music and to enrich the cultural life of Central PA, which I, I think we are doing. Um, and now you may advance that, please. <laughs> yeah. So basically, uh, the backbone of our output is live concerts, of course, and this year has thrown us a curveball, but we've still, as I said to you before we started, Justine, managed to, to shift almost everything online and we've produced a lot of content which is still available and I know you know that you have uh, comp codes to view our current and most uh, upcoming concert. In a normal year, normal times, <clears throat> we play 12 pairs of concerts at the Forum on the Capitol Complex. Has anyone, I would do a show of hands, has anyone been, you know some of you are, are HISO alum, has anyone been to an HSO concert? I don't know how to evaluate who's Hopefully yeah, the hands are up. Okay. Andy and Aaron. Good. That's good. So our normal season um, runs about October through May, during which we present Masterworks, which is uh, what we would call traditional classical repertoire. That's something from music from like 1800 to 2021 and Pops concerts, which are often uh, Broadway or Motown or film music or music with uh, sort of significant guest artists that you may hear of more often. And in the summer, we generally play four to five concerts around and on July 4th in the communities listed here. All of that combined with our youth orchestra uh, program and our concerts for young people reach about 35,000 people per year. Can we go to the next one? And for young audiences, we have, I'm very pleased uh, about what we've been doing for young audiences. We have one of the oldest youth orchestra programs in the country at 65 years old. And it has grown very recently from one group to now, this year it's five because of uh, gathering restrictions, but we have three main ensembles, high school, middle school, and elementary. Uh, the high school usually uses winds and brass. This year, everybody's strings. Uh, and the younger two groups are strings. Um, and we also, we are very, I think, conscious and welcoming to young audiences 
at, at the HSO concerts in the forum. So Musical Chairs is a wonderful program which offers very affordable uh, subscriptions for families. Young persons concerts take place four times a year where we invite school kids in during the school day uh, to listen to the orchestra. And Welcome to the Concert is a wonderful program which makes uh, customized sort of kid-friendly programs, like a printed program, and involves interactive stuff that uh, kids meet musicians at intermission, which is terrific. Some numbers, our annual budget is about $3 million. This year it's closer to two, um, because as you'll see below, a third of that generally comes from tickets. So essentially this year we have we have nominal ticket sales of about $15,000 for online viewing as compared to a million in a normal year. So we've reduced our entire budget to about two. That means 1 million is fixed expenses uh, staff salaries and benefits and legal and accounting fees, rent, things like that. And of our, of our total revenue, 65% comes from donations and sponsorships, which means donations of $5 or $75,000 or sponsorships of $1,000 to $100,000. Uh, we have about $9 million in endowed funds, which we draw from annually to offset uh, the loss between revenue and expense. We have 78 musicians. This is sort of the core orchestra. Often will be bigger than that, but closer to 90. But our regular musicians who we count on coming back year after year after year and who are hired for a year at a time come from 11 states. Uh, one comes from China. We're very, very fortunate to be placed geographically where we are because we're just driving distance to some of the greatest music schools and musical hubs in the country, of course. Um, and I think we're a pretty lean but efficient staff with eight full-time people, those that includes me, um, finance, uh, finance and accounting, marketing, fundraising, education, and operations, which is all sorts of all the mechanics of putting an orchestra on stage, and eight additional part-time who are mostly production people and people who help with education. Then we have 100 volunteers. Uh, who help greet you when you walk in the door of the forum, or they do very large mailings for us, or they pound the pavement and, and tell people what's going on. A, a large group of the pound, uh, pavement pounders is the Harrisburg Symphony Society, who have been around for 30 years, and, and they put on at least one sort of spectacular, large-scale annual event every year that raises a lot of money for us, and they're very like like I imagine the way you all function, they're wonderful advocates and ambassadors in the community. And this slide, if you, I don't know whether you can maybe leave this or send it to everybody, this is how to find us. Of course, harrisburgsymphony.org is our home base. Yeah, we can definitely bring that back up at the end and then oh. also um, share it with our attendees as well, so. Or send the whole thing to the whatever you like. Yeah, yeah. great, great idea. We'll share the whole thing. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you for going through that, Matt. Sure. Appreciate that. I will stop my share now um, and we'll get rolling with some questions. Again, attendees, feel free to ask some Q&A throughout if something pops into your head or, you know, the natural flow of our conversation brings up some new questions. We want to keep it casual and fun and informative. Um, all right. So, Stuart, this was one of our audience's questions. Um, that was brought up while people were registering for this webinar. What exactly is the duties of a maestro? And even further, kind of what is a maestro? Okay, well, I, I'll start out by saying that the word maestro is the Italian word for master. Um, and it's an honorific, it, uh, it isn't really a job title. So it's, it's what, what people call you, or at least in the old days, it was the general way that people referred to me. There are people that call me maestro. Um, there are certainly many players and, and people in the organizations I work with that call me Stuart. And, uh, and so I, I, I certainly don't care one way or another. I don't get offended if they do or don't call me maestro. But uh, my job with the orchestra is music director. And it covers actually quite a lot of ground. And I think that if I wanted to uh, make a generalization about what my job is, uh, I would say that, that as far as all artistic decisions for the orchestra, the buck stops here. I'm the final word on all artistic matters. That, that is not to say that I do it by myself. Matt and I have constant conversations about 
uh, artistic uh, matters. And at the same time, we have conversations about financial and administrative matters. And so um, he is the head of the administrative arm of the orchestra. I am the head of the artistic arm, but there's a lot of commingling. Um, and so my job, uh, the, the, the largest, most obvious part of my job is conducting concerts. Um, and that involves a long process of studying the music, learning the scores, uh, and then having rehearsal periods that I convey to the orchestra through gesture and through words, uh, how I want the music to sound. They just have their, their single parts. I have every part in my score. And so it's my job to make sense of it as a whole and guide the orchestra through that process. Uh, and then of course, to conduct concerts. Um, and so that's kind of one large part of it. The other part is uh, somewhat administrative, which is programming the concerts, deciding what music is going to be played, what guest artists we're going to feature, uh, what size orchestra we're using. Um, all of this has repercussions that are financial. And so I do get in, involved in the financial. Uh, just to give you an idea, if we do a Mozart symphony using, let's say, 50 players, it's going to cost almost precisely half as much as doing a Mahler symphony with 100 players. And so I can't be doing huge concerts all the time because it would put us out of business. Um, but coming up with a varied program, how much new music are we doing? What composers are we going to commission and pay to write new music for us? Uh, all of those decisions are mine. Uh, I also have, uh, you know, there's a, a large part of what I do that's public relations and marketing. I, mean, I am the face of the orchestra. And so I do things like this. Most of that is a great pleasure for me. I'm a people person. It's work, working with other people and dealing with other people is one of the things I enjoy most. And I think one of the things I do uh, pretty well. And so uh, I would say all of those things uh, co combined together is, is kind of a, a general idea of what my job is as a conductor and a music director. Yeah, that's a that's a big job. That's a lot of stuff you have to manage. There. It is a big job, and it, and it's a lot of compartmentalization. You know, it's mm -hmm. it, it's it's easy to uh, to focus on one thing, and then a lot of other tasks fall to the wayside. Um, but you learn early on that you have to be thinking well in advance and figure out how much of each concert you're going to have to do today. Um, most of it is going to be the the next one, but you know, today I was working on a chamber music program that I'm doing. In, in three weeks, I have a program next week that I'm gonna to have to start working on over the weekend. It's all stuff I've done before, so it shouldn't take a long time, but it's a lot of that kind of juggling, like mm -hmm. a, what, what needs to get done uh, to make things function most effectively. So that, that brings out an interesting point and an interesting question that I think that I have. So, you know, as young professionals and really in any professional environment, mostly you're, you're, you're gonna to have to work with a team and you have to manage a particularly large team, especially when you have your, your whole orchestra involved with 78 people, that's a lot. How do you manage, essentially, I mean, you're, you're the artistic master, you're, you're the one leading the vision, but how do you pull everybody together and really make the most cohesive team? Um, it's a really good question. And it's something that uh, is sometimes goes very smoothly and sometimes it doesn't go smoothly at all. Um, when you're talking about the 79 players in our orchestra, the, the first thing to keep in mind is that these are all incredibly highly trained, incredibly talented, uh, well-schooled uh, professional virtuosos. Every one of them uh, had to win a very competitive audition to get into the orchestra. They all have very deep understanding of the repertoire they're playing. Most of the repertoire, all of them have played before, if not many, many times. Uh, and so there's that first step of just respecting that and, and treating them as collegially as possible. Um, the, the unfortunate fact or the fortunate fact for me is that I am in fact the final arbiter of the way things go. Um, but, um, I, I, and I talk about this quite a lot, it's very rare for me to go into a rehearsal period where my vision of the music doesn't somehow shift somewhat based on what I'm getting from the players. I think if I weren't open to that, I'd be, you know, spiting myself uh, for no good reason at all. Um, I, it's just such a funny job because I'm a performer on the one hand, I am actually performing, but the performing that I'm doing is making no noise at all. It's actually just, it's spurring other people to make music. Um, and that's how I'm making music. Some people have described it as the orchestra being my instrument. Um, mm -hmm. I, yeah, it, it's my instrument with, with uh, you know, a hundred heartbeats and a hundred psychologies 
uh, all working at the same time. So yes, there's a lot of management involved, but it's not kind of your typical management job. I mean, in most cases, you can uh, a manager can designate and let people go out and then and then uh, recongregate. I mean, I'm hands on constantly. Now, there's a lot of letting go. You can't be micromanaging everybody there. It's just impossible for two hands, two eyes and a body to do that. Um, but uh, it, it, it's, it's a fascinating job. I mean, it, it's constant uh, feedback. I, when I'm conducting, I'm listening as much as I'm directing and reacting to what's coming at me. Uh, and it's, it, I love it. I mean, I feel very fortunate to be able to do this as a living. And I feel doubly fortunate that we have an orchestra made up of the, the quality of people beyond the quality of musicians that we have. Uh, by and large, our orchestra is, is really just terrific team players. And that's not always the case with professional uh, orchestras of this quality. Yeah, I know the caliber of talent. You know that that's required to to be in the in the orchestra. So I have a high level of respect for you as the leader of something like that. And I love how you said, you know, you're you're playing this instrument of the entire orchestra. I think that's such a great way to say it. That's the hardest instrument to play, I'd say. Well, and th there's another side to it too. Is the the orchestra has to want to be there. The orchestra has to want to play for me for them to do their best job. Um, and so it's, 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 uh, it's not just a question of musical respect. It also it, it borders into that kind of abstract world of affection and love and family. And, uh, and that's the kind of environment that I know Matt uh, would say the same thing we try to foster with this organization. Yes, and I can, I, I, the staff is relatively new to me, um, but I can speak as a former cellist in the section of the Harrisburg Symphony. Just moments before Stuart arrived here, uh, when I came back, a lot of people that played in those days, this was the 90s, are still playing here, which speaks really well, because as you know, I, I think I, it was implied in what I explained in the PowerPoint, it's not a full-time job for them, right? They come 12 weeks a year. Um, and being freelance musicians, a lot of them have a lot of choice about where they play and what they do. And the, the fact that they return year after year speaks well of, of all of us, and particularly Stuart. They they are a family. I mean, they really are. That's a big part of their experience because it's a very concentrated, you know, it's a strange life to go to a very concentrated event, four or five intense days long days with a bunch of people. And then you go home and do other things. And maybe you have students or maybe you, you know, have a, a, another part-time job in a, in a musical, another musical pursuit. And then you go do that same experience again with another group of people in another city. And it's, it's, you've got to stay very sharp and it has to be, you know, I, I say this cause I did it. You have to really want to be there or you desperately need the money. You know, I mean, it's- And there are better ways to make more money. There are better ways to make more money. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As a, you know, as a musician and, you know, I've, I've played in a variety of different orchestras and different points. Yeah. I mean, I know it's when you have an excellent conductor, you want to be there. They're, they're sparking your joy and your interest in the, you know, they, right. you form a picture in everybody else's head that you then guide and it's such a creation. So I think that's so beautifully put people stick around because there's a family there and they want to, they want to remain a part of it. Yep. Um, so Stuart, that kind of leads me to ask what's, I think we've kind of answered this in a way, um, but, but what's kept you with, with the Harrisburg Symphony for, for 21 seasons? That's a, that's a long standing. It is. Career. Well, for, for many reasons, I've been very, very happy here. Uh, that the, certainly the quality of the orchestra uh, is 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 a primary reason why I've stayed here so long, and and in fact I've very rarely even looked at other jobs uh, because it, it's hard for me to imagine a job that I would enjoy as much as this one. I really I love working with these people. I'm still challenged by it every time I get in front of them. I can do any any repertoire I want at a very high level. So yes, there's all of that, but then there's this whole other side of things and. Uh, and this is something that I actually would encourage young professionals to think about, um, because when you talk about a life and a career, um, a job has to be one element in the picture to have a happy life. And I feel like this job with the Harrisburg Symphony has afforded me a balance. And, and that's something that I think is very difficult to achieve as a conductor. Um, most, uh, most conductors who 
last in this business are traveling constantly. Um, a career can easily take over their lives. And I feel like this has allowed me to have a normal life, not just as a conductor, but also as a father and husband. Uh, and that is really kind of rare. And, and part of the reason why this orchestra particularly allows that is it's affordable. It's actually quite a beautiful town. Uh, the schools are pretty good. Um, it's, it's a good place to raise children. Uh, the, I would say that the, the values as a whole of this community are much more down to earth than you find in a lot of big cosmopolitan cities. Um, and so it's, it's really just worked out quite nicely for me. I, it, and, and in addition to that, I, I have a lot of good friends here. Uh, and, and so uh, I, I, I guess part of it also is inertia. You know, I, I, I'm sitting very comfortably here and you know, someone's gonna have to push me really hard to want to change that. Um, as long as I'm satisfied and happy. You know, when I first came here, one of the funniest, th they did a big article on me in the, uh, what was then uh, the print version of the uh, Patriot News, which doesn't exist anymore. Um, that's now just online, I think, or they do it a couple of times a week. I, at any rate, they had a big, article on the arts, which happened regularly and not anymore. Uh, and it was on me. And one of the things they were talking about is, you know, uh, they were having quotes of people involved with the orchestra. Well, he's certainly not going to be here for very long and all of that. And I, I remember being curious at the time why that would be the case, because my feeling is my long term goal in career is to be satisfied, you know, to feel challenged and satisfied to make enough money that I'm comfortable. Um, but also to, to have job satisfaction. And as long as that's the case, um, I'm not gonna be so quick to move to a different place where I may not have the same satisfaction. Uh, and so that I guess is the short answer to a very complicated question. Yeah, that was a great answer. I think it's, I think people assume when they hear Harrisburg that, oh, this is, you know, if for somebody, especially in a music career, like, you know, this isn't the this isn't the big town. This isn't the New York Philharmonic. But what they don't realize is the kind of talent that you get. Well, there are two uh, two things to think about when you think about Harrisburg. First of all, um, you are right. Harrisburg plays very much under the surface uh, of the the national attention in terms of culture. You know, they pay attention to Harrisburg every four years when there's a presidential election, um, because we're the capital of a of a purple state. Um, but we are really quite an extraordinary city. And I'll even take the, uh, the Harrisburg Symphony out of the equation. There's so much going on here and so much on a very, very high level in almost every sphere of, uh, uh, of performing arts. I mean, Andy Herring is on, on this call. Andy's the executive director of the Friends of Jazz and they do fantastic jazz performances constantly. We've, co we've collaborated with them often. Um, we have wonderful choirs, we've got wonderful chamber music, we've got wonderful theater, wonderful ballet, uh, and I could go on and on and on with almost any form. And, uh, and so that's one thing. And the other thing is that it's not, I, I think a lot of people look at areas like ours and think, oh, unsophisticated, you know, what kind of satisfaction would there be to play for a bunch of yokels like you'd have in Harrisburg? And that is, I think, such an amazing fallacy. Uh, for two reasons. One is that it just is false. You know, we have a very sophisticated audience here, but it's also fa false because any audience is the most important audience in the world. Whatever audience you're playing for is deserving of the highest quality because an audience, when it boils down to it, is in fact discerning. They can tell the difference. And let me, I, I, let me specify. I don't think that most audiences can tell the difference between very good and really good. But I do think that any audience can tell the difference between not so good and very good and between really good and spectacular. And so our job as performing artists is to be in that really good to spectacular range all the time. And that creates a lot of pressure, but that's the only way you can build an organization and build an audience is by having every concert be something worthwhile and uh, spectacular. Thank you. That, that was great. I'm curious for myself do you have a favorite piece or a favorite concert that you've conducted that you can look back on and say like man well that was just the best <laughs> like that I'll, I'll give you a couple of answers to that my okay. my, my okay. pat answer and there is some truth to this but it is kind of the uh, the easy way out is that whatever piece you're performing has to be your favorite piece um, you have to be utterly convinced of every piece you're performing but that I think is such a cop-out um, 
probably the most overwhelmingly satisfying experience I ever had was opening night of the year before, uh, was opening night of last year. So uh, uh, October of 2019, mm -hmm. where I got to do, uh, uh, conduct a 20 minute suite by my son. That was indescribably wonderful. Not only because funny. I thought it was a great piece. I mean, I really loved it. I, and, and I think it is a worthwhile, wonderful piece of music um, that I would recommend to, if he weren't my son. But just that, that connection, I mean, having him and then having him come on stage at the end, I, words uh, can't possibly describe that feeling. But, you know, in the general repertoire, I have so many, there are so many <laughs> pieces that I love so much. And there are pieces that kind of I forget about. And then when I come back to doing them, it just reminds me of how wonderful they are. And there are too many to actually specify and they, they range in so many different ways. And a lot of it has to do with what I'm looking for in a piece. Am I looking for, you know, heart on the sleeve kind of emotionality? Well, then I'm gonna go for some, you know, Tchaikovsky's Sixth Symphony. If, do I want something that's challenging and, uh, and exciting and edgy? Well, then maybe a late Shostakovich symphony like the 10th symphony. These are uh, amazing pieces, but you know, the, all four Brahms symphonies are among my favorite pieces and all nine Beethoven symphonies are uh, glorious works of art. And so, yeah, it's, it's, hard, it's to, hard to it's hard decide. To yeah. But that's so special that you're, that you, you were able to conduct what your son composed. And I know you have quite a long um, history of your own composures. Mm -hmm. So one of the questions I wanted to ask you, and I, I probably could have done my Googling and figured this out, but, at what age did you make your first, you know, did you compose your first piece? Well, you know, thank you for, for regarding me as a composer. Actually, one of the things about my son being a composer is that I've discovered that I'm really not a composer. It's kind of the difference between a great uh, artist and someone who just dabbles. Um, mm -hmm. I really didn't compose anything until I got to college. Uh, in high school, I was, uh, I was a uh, an excellent sight reader. I was the music director of all the school musicals. Um, I did the smallest amount of conducting musicals, one or two shows, but it was, it was from the piano. Uh, and I had a lot of, I mean, it was an amazing experience and I did a lot, a lot of things as a teenager that many musicians don't get to do. But I didn't even make a decision that I wanted to be a, a musician professionally until my senior year of college. But when I got to college, uh, I quickly dropped my math major that I was intending to do and became a, a theory and composition major in music just because I was turned on by the classes. I had passed out of the prerequisite classes so I was able to take advanced classes uh, and I enjoyed it. I mean, I, I liked uh, composing. It was something I had never done before. But when I go back now and look at the compositions that I wrote when I was in school, you know, there might be one or two that I would even spend the time to listen to myself, let alone uh, <laughs> expose someone else to. Um, now, over the years, I've written things for special occasions. I wrote a fanfare when I was in Charleston, South Carolina for the 25th anniversary of uh, the music director's tenure there. Um, I wrote another fanfare here uh, for uh, uh, just for a concert that I was doing with Brahms. Uh, and then I wrote another fanfare for uh, a concert down in, uh, in Florida and opening night here a few years ago. And these are pieces that I'm very pleased with, very proud of, but, uh, but again, I, I, I think my composition is very much a side uh, pursuit and, and not something that I think I'm particularly brilliant at. Sure, sure. Um, a couple of questions regarding, you know, our present environment in, in the COVID world. I know we're probably all sick of hearing about it, but we are in the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Um, one question um, more technically, um, how has, how have you guys adapted to the augmented reverb, reverb from the dividers that you've had to use as a result of COVID? Want me to answer that one, Matt? Actually, it's 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 a, a great question, and it's based on a fallacy. We don't use dividers. We don't. But what we've had to get used to, which is I think even more challenging, and and the reason we don't use divisors, the dividers, is because there's actually been there have been studies that have shown that it's not necessarily any better with the dividers, and in some ways could be potentially worse in terms of spreading the virus. Um, the biggest challenge has been distancing. Yeah. Um, and we do do distancing. It's the reason why we can't use large orchestras. We've been performing at the Whitaker Center with ensembles ranging from 10 to 25 people. Um, 
But for example, we did a brass ensemble concert and the brass players had to be 12 feet apart from each other and in all directions. So each person had his own six foot radius circle around him or her. Um, that is really, really hard because part of uh, playing in an orchestra, part of in playing of being in any kind of a performing ensemble is hearing each other and, and, and being able to adapt to what you're hearing in the moment. Um, and so uh, on the one hand, it, it increases the importance of my being there as a conductor, just for keeping things together. Um, but it also forced everyone to be very focused all the time. And I will say that the experience is, is rather stressful. Um, I'm really looking forward to getting back on, on the stage of the forum as an ensemble with none of these uh, restrictions anymore. But it's been a constant job. And, and our orchestra manager, a woman named Sue Click, has been uh, reading avidly all through this uh, pandemic about what the current research is, what's safe, what instrument. I mean, for example, right now, we probably can't do pieces with flute because flute is the biggest spreader of aerosols uh, can, containing potentially the virus. And so, you know, it, it's keeping a track of these things and, and the, the new technologies and the new research through the CDC and, uh, and NIH to be able to, uh, to put these concerts on, but it's really, really hard work, uh, both in preparation and in the actual execution. That's really interesting. I, I hadn't even thought about, you know, different instruments having a, a, a different impact. Yep. So um, when you're a, when you're a cellist, you can put on a mask. Right. Right. As a pianist, That's you can. Go and, ahead. I, I, at the same time, we all rely not only on being able to see and hear one another, we rely on listening to one another's breath more than we realize. Mm -hmm. And so the mask inhibits, the, I mean, it's just such a sad irony for musicians that breath is a, now a dangerous thing because we used to be so, right? Or potentially yeah. dangerous. Um, but no, I, I will echo what Stuart said. I mean, the breath, <coughs> all of them, playing far apart is really, really, really difficult, um, which is just adds another layer to the, how brilliant they are. I mean, well, and everyone's so happy to be there. To I'm sorry. Everyone, everyone is so happy to be there yeah. that they're willing yeah. to put up with all of these uh, these changes. Right. But yeah, th there's always this this baseline sadness and nostalgia for when things were oh. less complicated. Has it impacted your choice of 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 music at all? Have you entirely, of course? And, and I mean, we had an entire season planned for this year. That at the beginning of the year, one of the best choices we made was let's not go concert to concert. Let's just take the entire season and move it forward a season. So what we're planning now for next season, knock on wood, is to do uh, what we were planning to do this season. Um, and we've been making repertoire choices for concerts basically five to six weeks in advance of each concert mm -hmm. because you didn't know when a new strain would come and make things more dangerous. And the governor might say you can only have early on in the season, you could only have 20 people uh, in a room. And so that certainly made a huge uh, impact on what we'd be able to do. Um, and now it's a little bit different. Now we have mask mandates for being inside. And, you know, it's, and, and so in order to do that, we've really had to be tremendously flexible and on our toes concert to concert. Uh, we, we have two more concerts to do this year and we don't have finalized repertoire even though they're gonna happen at the end of May. Yeah, I'm sure that's that's very stressful. Yes, and I was even wondering, <laughs> I was wondering from like um, a theme, like a thematic perspective, if, if, if it's impacted like what you're choosing in terms of the mood you're looking to mm -hmm. portray, like just because it's kind of a somber thing that we've all been going through, like are, are, are you looking to do upbeat stuff or are you more? It's an interesting yeah. question. And, yeah. and early on, there were all kinds of seminars through the League of American Orchestras talking about these things. And one of the things that they were bringing up is like, no, you have to reflect our times. And so do dark oh. music and sad right. music. And my feeling is, are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. People are living that. Let, let them have an <laughs> escape. And so by and large, I've been choosing, well, I, I've been choosing music in the same way that I would normally choose music. Music that I think uh, is impactful, music that is pleasing, music that uh, uh, I would say I've been erring more on the side of music that's pleasant to listen to this year than that's dark and dismal. Although, you know, there are certainly pieces that we've done that are a little bit more intense. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I think the bigger question is when it's over, mm. when we're no longer quarantining, when we're back playing concerts live, will the repertoire choices 
at that point reflect this memory of this dark period now that we're no longer feeling it all the time. And I do think that probably there will be some of that in the same way that when World War I ended, there was a whole world of music that was very dark and very sad because of the impact of lives lost and, and, and lives impacted. I think that's the same thing is probably going to happen coming out of this pandemic. Yeah, not even just in, in the music world, I think across different art forms, there's gonna be a lot of Right, really absolutely. interesting reflection on this time that we're living through. So that's, As it should be. That's what yeah. art's that's how art happens. purpose is. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So we just got a great question from Olivia. Um, are the forum's renovations impacting your season at all? I'll let Matt answer this. Yeah. One. Well, the current season has, been, yes, sort of. Uh, but so the I don't remember when the forum closed, maybe over the summer, uh, as part of the essentially the lockdown right because it's a state building and every all state employees were not um but and and they have been doing renovation since then which i think they started maybe february so in the meantime as stuart said we've moved to whitaker center which is great and it has a, a lot of infrastructure technologically that helps us with prepare streaming shows um at this point we we are cautiously optimistic about returning to the forum in the fall mm -hmm. And it won't, if we don't go back, it will be COVID related, not renovation related. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Keep our fingers crossed. Yeah. <laughs> Matt, I'm curious what brought, as a, you know, as a musician, what brought you back and, and, and um, kind of influenced your decision yeah. to take this role as the ED? So in 2014, I became an executive director. I sort of left the stage and be, it became an administrator. I ran an orchestra called the Symphony of Northwest Arkansas, which is a small, about a million dollar annual budget, five to nine concerts a year in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Um, and that happened through a series of events that just it felt sort of organic. And then I thought, you know, I really kind of like this job and I don't miss playing the cello. You know, I know that you do, but I kind of don't. Um, but I'm, that's okay. I mean, I'm in a different phase in my life. And, um, I was totally perfectly happy. I mean, it was, it was a great place to live, great place to work. There's a, a wonderful art scene. I know uh, having grown up here, I grew up in Lancaster. Um, I would not have found Arkansas on a map because it's one of those places in the middle that you don't really, you know, can't tell apart from one another. And then uh, I wasn't looking for a job, but I get on, you get on all these mailing lists in your field. And there was an announcement about Harrisburg Symphony. I thought, you're kidding me, Harrisburg Symphony, because I had played here and somehow my parents are still here an hour away. I'm an only child, nobody's getting any younger. And I thought, you know what, this, this has been a great job. It's a well-run company. It has a great reputation. It always sounded good. Let's see what, how this works. And I applied and here I am. Here you are. Here well, we're glad you're Happily. here. Happily, yes, Thank indeed. You. Yeah. Another question that I think could go to either one of you, um, how can HYP really engage the Harrisburg Symphony Orchestra and, you know, enhance your mission for the arts in the Harrisburg community? Well, I, I would start by saying that um, if you haven't been to see the symphony, come and see the symphony. And, and uh, I think that really is the first, the first step in any kind of an engagement is finding out whether it's for you. And, and I say that with the greatest confidence that most people will like what we do, but there are people that simply don't, and there are many choices these days. I don't think there are too many things that are quite like going to a symphony concert. I just think there's something about all those people together playing great music together that that's that's quite infectious. And people who don't even think they like this kind of music might find themselves very surprised. Now. Once you decide, yes, this is something that we like, there are so many ways you can get engaged. I mean, I think starting with advocacy, I mean, telling people, telling people particularly your age, this is something I like doing. This is something that's really worth doing. Come with me sometime, let's go check it out. Um, and all the way up, up, in, up to joining our board of directors. I mean, we, we, have, um, we have a board of directors that's mostly older people. And we are desperately looking for people who are interested, uh, engaging, smart, um, and, and focused on making this a better place uh, to be involved with the symphony, to give us a point of view that we may not have. 
I mean, it, 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 it's amazing to me to think about the fact that I'm, I'm, I'm heading towards 60. You know, when I first came here, I was in my late 30s. So I, I, could, I could become a member of the Harrisburg Young Professionals at that point. Um, and now I'm, 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 I'm older and, I, and I'm not quite in tune with, with the, the young anymore. I mean, I have children who are more or less your age. And so I do believe that uh, if you want to get involved, we will get you involved. Um, but I do think that the biggest thing you can do is just come enjoy what we do um, and tell your tell your friends and colleagues that you did. Um, Matt, do you have anything that you can add to that? Oh, I would. I, I echo all of that. I would only add that at the same time, we do, Stuart is right that we do have so many choices of, of how to spend your entertainment dollars and time in Harrisburg, <laughs> which is a great problem to have. Um, but we have, you know, tickets that start at $18. You can buy one. You don't have to subscribe. I mean, it's much more flexible, I think, than it seems. I know that there's this old sort of subscription model that we all envisioned from maybe 50 years ago when every, the whole family went to the symphony every Friday for every other week for the entire year. Um, but we're accessible in that way. We're flexible in that way. And frankly, as someone at the beginning of a career, I would think it would be a very good room to be in because we do, we are fortunate that we are well connected through the board and through sponsorships to a lot of, uh, of the largest and most influential businesses in town. I'm not suggesting that it's a networking opportunity, but I'm not saying it's not. I mean, it is, it, that's, there is that element. And I know that we consciously in the arts are aware that people who, uh, major funders are interested in rec rec recruiting and retaining high level employees. And on their list is a thriving arts sector in addition to you know healthcare and education and restaurants and, and outdoor space and all of that. Um, so there, it, there, is, uh, there is that element. Let me just put it that way. I'm not really sure what the young professionals do. I mean, I know that I, I was at Leadership Harrisburg and Sydney was there and spoke and you sometimes gather around a particular cause. I don't know, do you do things en masse? Like, would you all come together? Oh, that that would be fun. I mean, we, fun. we um, so our mission is to, you know, enhance the areas of live, work and play in, mm -hmm. in the city, right? So. I know I'm in conversation uh, with Corey from the board. Our yeah. hope in the future is to help uh, do a collaborative event where we do like um, a night at the symphony sort of sort of thing and maybe have a, a prearranged dinner and then have a group of people go together. So something that really brings people into the fold. Um, but right. yeah, I mean, we're, we, we have an ec economic development committee. We're, we're trying to, you know, put our hands in everything and really yeah. make a difference where we can. So I know it's absolutely our, our goal to get further involved with your cause uh, moving forward. And with, mm -hmm. with COVID happening, I'm glad that we're able to take this first step in the, in the, in the right direction and, and get to pick both of your brains. Um, so thank you for that. But I think your your answers were were fantastic. I mean, it's and, an outlet. And I'll also for... add one more thing that feedback is incredibly valuable and important. So, mm -hmm. um, I would encourage you. I mean, if, obviously, if the if the Harrisburg Young Professionals come as a group, that's great. But even if you individually come, if there are things you particularly wow. liked, things you didn't particularly like, things you were hoping for that didn't happen or did happen, these are these are bits of information that are so incredibly valuable to get. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I think engagement is really uh, is what it's all about. And it works in both directions. You know, we want right. to do we want to be the organization that you want to come to. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think we can be. Sure. Oh, yeah, I, I think so, too. So I I wanted to ask you a little bit about your career, Stuart. I know you've got an incredible you know, you have ha you have some excellent accolades and some really impressive um, accomplishments throughout your career. So I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit, you know, about how you got to where you are, and you know, what what's what's your biggest accomplishment in your in your eyes? Um, and and I'm going to be sappy and sentimental. My biggest accomplishment, without a doubt, is my two children. And and if I had to drop the world of music completely, 
uh, and still had that, I would be a successful person. So I, I, I really do believe that. I, I'm very, very proud of that. In terms of, uh, of, of music, my greatest accomplishment, I don't know, I, I, I'll be a little bit general in that my greatest accomplishment is most people who have worked with me enjoyed working with me. I, I think that's a, that's a real accomplishment. Very few people I think would have bad things to say about the experience of working with me, either as a conductor or as a music director or whatever uh, other projects I've done. And I've done a lot of, 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 of cool, interesting things. But uh, I, I think that the key to, to, to the way I've approached my career is if you think of kind of the main route being conducting, even that has very much evolved because when I graduated from college, uh, and decided I wanted to be a conductor, I had no expectation of having an orchestra of this quality. At that point, I was really thinking like, you know, anything, whether I, you know, conducting at a small university somewhere, uh, conducting a, a, a good community orchestra, conducting, uh, you know, a, a high school orchestra, I mean, anything at that point would have been satisfying. And then I got into a really good uh, pair of graduate schools and I studied with one of the great teachers in the world. And suddenly my expectations shifted a little bit, but even then, I, I didn't have like, you know, I, I wasn't thinking you're gonna conduct the, you know, the Boston Symphony or anything like that. Um, and then that gradually, as, as I got jobs, it, it changed as time goes on. But so if you think of the main thrust of my career as being that, being a conductor and, and that development, at the same time, I, I'm constantly, you know, keeping my peripheral vision open for things that come up that might not have anything to do with conducting at all that would be interesting and fun. And so uh, in the 1990s, I had an opportunity to be an actor for seven weeks at the Kennedy Center in a very amazing uh, Tony Award winning best play with one of the great actresses in the history of, of, of the stage, a woman named Zoe Caldwell and Audra McDonald, who is kind of the, the current, one of the greatest performers in Broadway history. So. That was that came out of the blue. It happened for a while, and then it was over, and I was back on my main thrust. And similarly, when I when I did my Broadway show, a show called Moving Out, um, with Billy Joel and Twyla Tharp, that kind of came out of the blue and took me off in a different direction for several years. Um, I was still conducting, but a lot of my life was devoted to to that show, uh, and it and it turned out to be one of the great uh, achievements, one of the great experiences of my life. Um, it really changed the way I think about conducting, um, as did the acting. I mean, you, you, you spend time with great, uh, great uh, performers in any performing arts sphere, and you learn a lot about your own in terms of what it means to make a life as a performer and to do it on a very, very high level consistently night after night. And I have the same experience you know, in, in a different way here in town with, with my many colleagues. Again, to talk about the jazz world, Steve Rudolph and I are great friends. We talk a lot about this. You know, what does it mean to be a performer and to, to have to maintain a high level of performance for many, many years? Um, and so th that's how it's been for me, just kind of leaving myself open to possibility, seizing the opportunities when they come up and then performing well. Um, without performing well, you're not gonna get hired back or you won't get hired in the first place. And so, you know, I, I, you know to preach a little bit to young people in, uh, in, in your positions, um, leave yourselves open to possibility. Don't get too focused on just what you're doing because it's those possibilities that could bring something into your life that makes it that much more fascinating and, and, and wonderful. And, and that's what I've tried to do and it really has served me quite well. That's, I think that's great advice. And, you know, you talk to a lot of people, um, they found their passions like accidentally through something that, that may have never, that that door may have never been opened, but, you know, they kept their minds open. Yeah. They, 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 they put the time into it and ended up being, you know, well, one and of the worse than that, the worst mistake that people make is self-selection not mm -hmm. to do something. Um, and, and every step of the way, I mean, certainly with the acting, I mean, when the idea with my conducting manager at the time said he had an audition for me to act in a play by Terrence McNally, I was like, are you out of your mind? I'm mm -hmm. not an actor. Uh, and it turned out to be amazing. And the same thing when I was offered to do Moving Out and, and the producer called and said he wanted me to meet Twyla Tharp. My initial feeling was you're not a rock musician. You don't really know what you're doing in that world. And so why would you do that? And yet, you know, 
it, it, what comes back to my mind is I have a lot of friends who are actors and they say, you know, if you're in an audition and someone says, do you speak Swahili? The only answer to give is yes, yes. I do. And then you spend the next two weeks learning how to speak Swahili. Sure. Yeah. Um, never ever uh, make the decision not to hire you for, for, for the person who's doing the hiring. That's the best yeah, advice I can point. give. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's so true. I think we always, you know, it's it's so easy to limit yourself and- It's true. And it's such a, that, a devastating yeah. thing yeah. to Joe, do that. It's it. Joe Polisi, who was the president of the Juilliard School for 30 or 35 years said once, never take a job you're absolutely certain you know how to do. <laughs> it's a good idea. It's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, because then you never know what you're really capable of. Or if you're going to grow at all. Right, right. And I mean, exactly. and, and when Sydney was at the, the last week at the panel, there was this discussion of satisfaction. And I'm not sure, I think Stuart is suggesting this already. I'm not sure that 100% of life satisfaction comes from a job. I don't know what that job would be. Maybe there is such a job. But I think, I think if there is such a job, it's still going to be fleeting. Because at yeah. some point, the job won't be as satisfying or the job will be over. Right. And then there has to be a, a, a safety net, an emotional safety net underneath that, that keeps you engaged right. and focused. But the job could lead you to people that are rewarding. That is true. A, a place that is rewarding or some sort of experience that you didn't see coming before that is makes the job rewarding, right? Yep. Without this job, I wouldn't have this other thing that is not mm -hmm. the job, but it's a byproduct of the job, which makes my life better. Yeah. We're preaching at them. I think we're preaching at them. I apologize no, no, no. for that. Sorry. I think we we want you to preach at us. This okay. is the whole point. Yeah. We want to we want to know this stuff. This is important. You're successful people. We want to we want to take something from you. Um so we we had a question from one of our attendees uh, regarding your mentors. Who have been notable mentors or influences? And this could go for both of you. Um you, you know, want to take uh, this one first, life. Matt, or shall I? I'm having a hard, it's embarrassing to my mentors. I'm having a hard time. I'll talk to it while he yeah, thinks about huge, it. I don't have an obvious answer. That's terrible. I don't really have uh, anyone who I can say that was my mentor. I was very fortunate when I was younger uh, to have a piano teacher and her husband, who was also a piano teacher, um, who served as mentors through my musical growth as a young person. Um, and it went so far beyond just teaching me how to play piano um, and, how to, in, and, and how to learn theory and all of that and how to perform and really went into how to be a good person, how to be a good person who has a balanced life. Um, they got who I was, they, they understood my insecurities and for that I'm incredibly grateful. I had a, a wonderful conducting teacher who wasn't a wonderful person. And so I wouldn't call him a great mentor but certainly in terms of the education that I got from him, I'm very, very grateful for that. Uh, and then I was also very lucky in my very first job uh, as a conductor, um, which was down in Charleston with the Charleston Symphony Orchestra, the music director there really was a very good mentor. He was not a great conductor and don't share that. Um, he's, <laughs> he's, he's, he's now deceased and he, he was a really good man and a good friend, mm -hmm. but he really, helped me and he mostly helped me by just letting me go and let me do things without micromanaging. Let me do lots of concerts of different kinds of music. And that was exactly what I needed at the time. And then lastly, I'll mention, I've been very fortunate to have um, a circle of professional friendships uh, who, have, who have given me the kind of feedback that most conductors don't get from musicians. I mean, really highly critical, constructively critical uh, feedback on what I do. And those years in Charleston, it was a very young orchestra. We were all friends. We hung out together constantly. And every concert that I did, I would then have sessions with friends from the orchestra who would say, this was really good. This you really need to work on. This could be better, you know, and, and boy, how lucky am I for that? Most of the time, either musicians don't say anything to you or they only compliment you. And that's really, I mean, it feels good, but it's, it's not really helpful. Yeah. Matt, have you come up with a mentor? I, think, <laughs> I have a few in mind, but no, I think the theme is that like having been raised, uh, trained as a musician from age 12 or so, one spends a lot of time alone in the practice room. And then the teachers that we, like your conducting teacher who was a good teacher, but not a great person to emulate. Um, 
and I think I might know who that who that was. You definitely know. Who yeah, that was. <laughs> uh, we, we get in these positions, and it's true. And especially in high level musical training, you know, you, you encounter these characters who are, who in some ways, absolutely awful, but they're masters of the instrument and the art form. And so you glean from them. And then it was just around the. I had a, a wonderful teacher in high school, too. They were a team. And then out uh, when I graduated Juilliard in '95, I met a teacher who I ended up working for and learned a little bit about nonprofit management from actually. Those were the people that stick out in my mind as who, who bridge the gap between, you don't have to be just great at this thing. You can also be a good person and have a good life. Because sometimes when you're deep in studies, it gets separated, right? Because of course there is the 10,000 hours or whatever else that you have to, because if there's sort of a window, if you're not really if you don't quite get there by a certain age, it's very hard to catch up and it's a competitive field. But I think those people stick out, the ones who were the most well-rounded of them, not necessarily the greatest stars of their field, but they had the kinds of lives and families and, and outlooks that, that I would, that I hope to have. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Mm -hmm. um, there's things you can take from, from everybody, right? But yeah. the people who have it all, that's, that's who you really want to learn yeah. the most from. Um, so Stuart, I'm curious about that balance between your performing and your conducting side. Do you have, you know, a preference? Are you more passionate about one over the other or do you kind of enjoy them equally? You mean within uh, playing the piano and, and conducting? Yes, yes, um, exactly. Well, I enjoy them all. I'll start with that. I mean, it's a very different experience to play chamber music with a few people than to conduct an orchestra. And it's very hard to even compare the satisfaction levels because it's almost like absolute satisfaction in totally different ways. Mm -hmm. um, I love conducting and I love finishing a concert and getting that feedback from the audience and having the orchestra as part of it. I mean, it's just, there's this like uh, the, the, this group mentality that's a uh, large group mentality that's mm -hmm. that's unique. Um, having said that, playing and I, I'm doing this concert in a few weeks with with some really, really close friends uh, and yeah, that that that's also a, a wonderful experience because you're kind of it's kind of like hanging out on stage, making music together, but still just kind of having a nice hang. And there just happens to be an audience who's <laughs> enjoying it too. Um, so that, that's also pretty good. The, the, the sad truth is, I mean, I'm a good pianist, but I'm not a good enough pianist to make a career doing that. I mean, to, to, to make a career as a, as a pianist, you have to have technique that really goes beyond mine. Uh, and that's not even false modesty. It's just, it's just a statement of fact. I'm very good uh, as I'm a very good colleague. I'm a very good chamber musician. So really good players like playing with me. But I think if they played with me all the time, they'd be feeling, well, we need someone who has a little bit stronger left hand on those really difficult passages, that kind of thing. Um, so I feel very fortunate that I get to do as much as I do. And, I, and I'm very discerning in terms of the kind of repertoire that I take on. I only take on repertoire that I think I can play really well. Um, and as I've gotten older and played more, that's that level has gotten higher and higher. But I, you know, I, I've played concertos with the orchestra. I've played chamber music with some of the best players in the world. And uh, so when it happens, it's really, really exciting for me. But I also wonder if, if I did that all the time, I think I would really, really miss conducting. Mm. And if I only conducted all the time, I think I would probably have an easier time not playing chamber music. But that's just a guess. I don't know. I really do. I, I do have it all. And I'm very, very lucky about that. Yeah, I, I think that makes sense. That kind of leads me to a, another question and saying that you've worked with some of the best chamber musicians in the world. Who would you identify as the most skilled or the most notable musician that you've worked with in your career? Wow. That, that's an impossible one to answer. Um, I mean, I, I, I've met some truly dazzlingly brilliant musicians. And, you know, I, I, I don't even think I could like choose who's the best pianist I've worked with or the best violinist I've worked with. Um, mm -hmm. and, and different, you know, I've worked with great concerto soloists who would make lousy concert masters and vice versa. And I've worked with great chamber musicians who would make lousy orchestral players. Um, and so it's, boy, it's that, that's an impossibility. Mm -hmm. 
to answer. I, I, I think we have members of our Harrisburg Symphony Orchestra that I would put up in the world of some of the best musicians I've ever worked with, um, but just in their own very particular ways. Um, and, and I've worked with some soloists who, who absolutely blew me away. Every moment that they played was a moment of, of revelation. Um, so I'm gonna duck that one. Because <laughs> I honestly don't think I can, uh, I can adequately answer it. Matt, anything from you on that? Of the greatest people I've ever played with? Other than me. Huh? Other than me. <laughs> I've never played with Stuart Molina. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't played together and I'm, no. you know, I'm such a terrible amateur now. I'm so out of shape. No, I cannot answer that question for the same reason. I mean, I have, moment, I have memories in my head of moments of, of people that I just was astounded by, but it's a, uh -huh. yeah, it's a, that's a tough, that's a very difficult question. Is this I'm sorry. Recorded? I'm sorry no, to no, throw no. a tough one at you guys. Oh, no, no. It's, it's actually a really good question and I, I just don't know how yeah. I can answer it. Yeah. Yeah. As a, as a cello nerd, I have to ask you if you've ever yes. met Yo-Yo Ma, because I just think I'm obligated to ask that question. I have. I are have you asking too. me or are you asking Both me? of you, both of you. Yeah, we have. I, I have actually on several occasions, and one of them was a, uh, uh, a um, rehearsal dinner for a wedding where it was just oh, wow. me and him and the family. And, uh, and so I actually had a really nice chance mm -hmm. to get to, on, on, to know him a little bit, but I also played it for master classes for cellists wow. for him on a few occasions. He, he's, he's quite an amazing uh, figure, not, not just a great cellist, not just a great uh, uh, person, but just kind of an important figure. I mean, he, yeah, he is absolutely. iconic in so yeah. many ways and, uh, and being in, in his presence, what, what I was always struck with is just how down to earth he really is that nice. Yeah. I met him more than one, like, and he won't stop talking to you until they take him away. Like he really is, that guy that he portrays, that's yep. him. Yeah. I'm so glad that I asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> we, we don't have to take any wind out of your sails. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Stuart, that's one of the things that I, I, from this whole thing I'm drawing from you, like you're so proud of being a leader and you're so, I mean, it, se it seems like you're the same way. You're so down to earth and you're just, you're, you're such an excellent an interesting person to be able to talk to in this space. So well, thank you. I appreciate yeah, that. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, right. I learned early on that if you don't, if, if you find, if, if you create a professional persona, and this isn't only true in conducting, but in anything, if you create a professional persona that is not who you are, it's going to create such unbelievable pressure mm. going forward. I just don't want, I, I have no reason to do that and no desire to do that. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I try to be the same person on the podium, the same person talking to an audience, talking to the Harrisburg Young Professionals as I would with my, my friends. It's simpler. Yeah, it's much and people easier. recognize that, that, yeah. that genuineness in you. I think you're right. Um, so I have one more question, but I wanted to just say, you know, as we're wrapping up, if anybody has questions to ask in Q&A or in the chat, you know, please type them in now and we'll make sure to field those before we wrap up. And I also um, will add that if you have questions that we don't get to, or you think of them later on, just send them to us. Email yeah. us. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so, so my last question is, you know, what is your vision for the future of the Harrisburg art scene and how, how does the Harrisburg Symphony Orchestra fit into that? For, I'll start if you don't mind. I think sure from the, the short amount of time that I've been here and gotten to know our colleagues in the art scene, I, I think it's in, incredibly well-connected and very collaborative and, and supportive, which is what everyone says to you when you're applying for a job in a new town, but it's totally true here. Uh, and it, it is evidenced by the way we've rallied in, in sort of think tanks this year and stayed in touch with one another. And of course our, our newfound partnership or a newly strengthened partnership with Whitaker Center. Um, I think we can continue this. I think, you know, of course, the public health crisis is going to change things for a while. I don't know if someone could tell us an end date. Arts people like to plan two or three years ahead. So this has been very strange for us not to. Um, I think we, we have a great foundation because of the tight, tight knit community we have and the generosity of the community that we have um, to move forward and, and to change in ways. Um, when we look back, nobody uh, six or nine months ago, 
nobody in the theater or performing arts business in Harrisburg said, we should really take some stuff online and look at what we've done out of necessity. I think we, we're uh, well equipped for this, although we're, we're not used to being, you know, we, we stick with what works. But I think, like I said, we have a great foundation and I think we'll, this has in a certain sense brought us closer together. And I, in terms of what I envision, I mean, looking way down the line, I mean, once we're past this bump, and I think we will be, I, I think that this community is perfectly positioned to, to get back up to speed fairly quickly. Um, and, and I'll echo what Matt says. I mean, I feel like I'm not just collegial, but friendly, if not close friends with almost every arts leader <laughs> in the community, which is really kind of nice to be able to say. We have each other's backs and we really do consider each other's successes, our own successes. Mm -hmm. um, and that I think is the, the most important thing for a, a, an arts community to thrive is not to be feeling like it's 12 different organizations on their own, but rather we're part of this big picture. And I think that the more that we can create big picture uh, uh, feeling, the better. I, I think that the key is getting an underlying uh, feeling within the community, within the people who live here, uh, that the art scene is central to their lives. Not specifically the symphony, not specifically the, you know, but everyone will have their own different things, but that one of the things that makes Harrisburg special and, and a good place to live is our art scene and I wanna be a part of it. If we could get most people who live here to have that feeling, then anything is possible. Then we're all going to thrive. We're all gonna do really, really well. Um, and, and I think that the ways that one achieves that are through further collaborations, um, uh, through, you know, and, and that creates cross-pollinization of audience. Um, we did one of our concerts this year, one of our Pops concerts was done with Steve Rudolph and Jonathan Ragonese, mm -hmm. uh, jazz, all new jazz arrangements with the Harrisburg Orchestra strings. And those are the kinds of events, you know, all of the jazz lovers watched it and got to see what the right. symphony does and all of the symphony people got to see what the jazzers do. And so um, we, we've done things with, uh, with the theater companies. We've done things with several of the choruses, with the Market Square concerts, with the ballet company. And, and I think that more of that uh, is in the future for us. I think mm -hmm. that's, that is really win-win for everybody. Yeah, it seems like the, the word there is collaboration. That's, Absolutely. That's what we need. Yep. We got a really interesting question. I think this is such a cool one. Thank you, Aaron, for asking this. Um, he actually prefaced this with potentially hard question. Right, right. What is one symphony you would recommend a classical music newbie listen to? Mm. Wow. You know, it, it's it's tough to answer that because different people have different tastes. Yeah. So for some, for one person, you might want to listen to. I mean, you, the the Beethoven symphonies. If you haven't heard the Fifth Symphony, it, it's yeah. it's hard not to be grabbed by that. Um, you know, go to YouTube and find a, a, a recording of a of a great orchestra playing the Fifth Symphony, the Seventh Symphony. I wouldn't even advise the Ninth Symphony. I think the Ninth Symphony is a little more than some people want to take. But that's kind of its own kind of music. There are people who would much prefer to listen to like, uh, you know, the, the uh, um, Shostakovich Fifth Symphony or the Tenth Symphony, something that's a lot harder hitting, a lot darker, a lot more intense, or a Mahler Symphony, Mahler's First Symphony. But these are, th those are big dishes to serve. So it really depends on who you are. Um, there's so much great music of so many different kinds. What I would suggest uh, is, uh, an idea that I heard for the first time from our timpanist Peter Wilson and we were doing a post-concert uh, question and answer session and they asked about uh, new music and you know, you know how do you feel about new music and he said that you have to look at classical music kind of like dating. You go out on a date with somebody and you're kind of there for at least an hour you know, you're not going to go there for five minutes and be like, blech, and walk out. You're going to be with this person for an hour. And there are several outcomes. One is, that was great. I can't wait to do that again. Sometimes it's, you know, that was a, a, a good way to spend an hour, but, you know, we don't, we'll go our separate ways. And sometimes it was like, that was the worst hour I've ever spent. But if you have a date where it's the worst hour you ever spent, you don't stop dating. You go out on another date and try someone different. And it's the same thing with music. If you, if you listen to a Beethoven symphony and are turned on by it, there are eight others that are really, really good and lots of others in that genre. If you listen to a Shostakovich symphony and love it, great. If you listen to a Bartok piece and hate it, 
don't listen to Bartok anymore. Maybe listen to something that's in the 19th century. And I don't wanna leave out all the music that's being written today. This is in fact, your music. This is the music that is written by, in some cases, 20 somethings or 30 somethings that reflects their existence in this complicated world right now. And it may very well be that you have an appreciation for this music that I can't even approximate because it reflects your lives and not ours. So I would just say, be open. I can, you know, if you'd like, Aaron, I'd be happy to send you a list of like the top 20 things that you might enjoy listening. For my daughter, who's of your generation or maybe a little bit younger than your generation, the be all and end all piece is the New World Symphony by Dvorak. She never gets tired of it. It is a spectacular piece of music. And that might be a good starting point. It's classical enough for a romantic piece. It's romantic enough for a romantic piece and it's modern enough that it, it doesn't sound stale in any way. And it's got great tunes and uh, it's wonderfully orchestrated. So maybe it's Dvorak's Ninth Symphony. That might be a good place to start, but don't give up if you don't like it. If you don't like it, write to me and I'll send you other suggestions. Awesome, Matt, do you have anything to add there? No, I think that's great advice. I just, I'm reminded of a story. I, I was meeting with a potential donor. Uh, this was in Arkansas years ago. And she said, I don't know anything. She didn't know anything about classical music. She said, where do I start listening? And I gave her the whole subscription series for the year that we had planned, which was five concerts and a, like a Christmas concert as well. And I said, just go down the list on YouTube and see what you like. And she would report back, like, I like this, but I didn't like this. And I like this. So then she found, you know, her taste and what she preferred. And then she came to a concert and it worked out. But yeah, just start somewhere. Well, and, and actually he brings up a very good point. Mm. And that listening to a recording of a great piece is not going to be what the experience is. No, of course not. And right. I would say the better choice is choose any live concert, doesn't matter what the repertoire is. If I'm conducting it, I guarantee you at least I think it's great music. Yeah. And come to the concert and experience that because that is a profoundly different experience from listening to a recording. I mean, it really is just the same as if you listen to a Bruce Springsteen recording, it's good. If you go to a Bruce Springsteen concert, it, it's uh, unbelievable. And, and so live music is really what it's all about. Mm -hmm. If you're listening to a recording, and I include even the recordings we've done this year for the symphony, it's just not the same. It's, it's a close but not quite approximation of the experience. I was going to say the same thing. There's nothing like, I, I've been to the symphony, I've, I've been to several, uh, you know, several concerts, and there's nothing like the magnitude of it. And I think that's one of the big differences between, say, Bruce Springsteen and, and you know, hearing 78 different yeah. different musicians performing in one space it, it's it kind of it kind of blows you away so and sharing that experience with 1400 other people who exactly experience right. it at that moment yeah i remember going it, back in the early 1990s i went on a date to opening night of the orchestra that i was the associate conductor of and i was sitting with her and she spent the entire concert kind of like this and at the end of the concert i was like so what did you think she said I have no idea what I just listened to, but it was overwhelmingly powerful. Hmm. I didn't understand a bit of it, and yet I can't wait for more. And, and I thought that, that that actually, that's an amazing reaction, and that's such a positive reaction. It's like something happened. Mm -hmm. I didn't really have to understand the syntax of music or the harmonies oh. or even what the piece was about. It just did something to me. That's what the live experience is all about. Mm -hmm. This is going to sound so silly, but you just remind, reminded me of in Pretty Woman when he takes her to the opera and she yeah. cries at the end. Yeah, you are. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's that it's kind of It's great experience. art for a great reason, you know, yeah. and, and, and allow yourself to experience, you know, great art of any kind. And, and I will go on to say that if not the symphony, then choose something else, but, but go, try it. D don't just stream movies, and I stream plenty of movies. Watch the whole Falcon and the Winter Soldier last night. <laughs> well, that's what and we have to do these days. But it was entertaining, but it was not yeah. the same. <laughs> <laughs> well, now I think we all have something to look forward to. We're all we're all going to go to the symphony. That's a done deal. <laughs> Hooray! And and we all have the wonderful recordings to listen to um, in the near future here as well. So we've got something to hold us over. 
Um, but it's 720, so I don't I don't want to wow. keep you to any longer. Thank you so, so much for joining us. Thank you uh, to our attendees for joining us as well. Um, like Stuart said, please feel free to send any questions, any comments, anything. Um, I'll make sure it gets to them. And then we will also share the, actually, why don't I just see if I can pull up really quickly so I can read off the, the concert uh, link that you provided to me, or the, the code, I'm sorry. That way everybody has that handy. Um, it is HYP2021. And that will give free access to the two most recent concerts um, for the Harrisburg Symphony Orchestra. So thank you guys again for, for providing us with that. Well, let me tell you just uh, in, in a nutshell what they are. The first one, which is airing right now until Sunday. Um, so if you'd like to watch it, watch it in the next four days, is our string section playing kind of lighter classical music and uh, a little bit more popular music, dances, tangos. It's really quite lovely and beautiful. Um, and the next one is going to be a, kind of the opposite end of the spectrum, entirely done by our percussion section, ranging from purely drum percussion pieces uh, to uh, ragtime done entirely on keyboard instruments, uh, xylophones, marimbas, uh, to uh, the, the piece that we end with is this uh, tribute to the, uh, the drummer from Led Zeppelin, a real kind of rock and roll, classic rock kind of thing. So it should be a lot of fun, but very, very different from anything we've done before. So I recommend them both highly. Yes, me too. I'm so excited to listen to both of them. <laughs> like, seriously, I'm, I'm so, so excited. <laughs> Thank you guys again. Really Thank appreciate you. your time. And we look forward to doing more stuff with you in the future. Um, have a great evening. Stay yes. safe Thank and you, healthy Justine. to everybody. Everybody take care. Bye-bye, everyone. Night. Thanks again, Justine. Oh, thank you.